Off in the far reaches of Alexander's now dead empire, some of the greatest cavalrymen to grace the Hellenic world honed their skills. Bactria, the sprawling urban satrapy of the Hindu Kush mountains, has found itself under the weakening grip of the Seleucid Diadochi state and it struggled to grab any power sweeping from the ruins of Alexander's empire. Rather than focus on power grabbing and fighting, Sophites of Bactria is looking to turn the massive cities along the river into sprawling metropolises and to control what would eventually become the Silk Road. The people of this region are not Greeks, but they're welcome as citizens of the satrapy of Bactria, and quite frankly, they'll be the backbone of the whole region with how numerous they are. Bactria as a region is full of bustling cities and beautiful shrines, but where the region could just be someone else's resource tap, Sophites plans to turn it into a fully-fledged state of its own, with a thriving Macedonian and Bactrian population. But the struggles presented before him, with Seleucus Nicator watching over him, and the hostile horse of the steppes breathing down his neck might put Bactria in peril. Whatever Bactria's fate might be, the region will either become the jewel of someone else's empire, or a diamond all its own. Before we get into the video, I want to add in here that this video is part of an event hosted by Laith as well streamers, and he's looking to revive Imperator to Rome. Apparently, if we can get the concurrent players to 100k, the game may just get revived, and I would love to see that. So please, viewer, if you have Imperator on Steam, go launch it and play it for a bit today to help contribute to bringing this game back. Thanks to the Invictus mod team, Imperator has evolved far beyond its low reputation of the past, and I hope it gets another chance from Paradox. Enjoy the video. Sophites began his rule with a focus on the most central and vital part of Bactria, since he was unsure of how his borderlands might fare against the Diadochi and Sakas. He encouraged minor levels of syncretism between the Hellenes and Vox sites given that the overwhelming majority of his realm worshipped the native gods of the Oxus, but he did intend to bring the people into the Hellenic fold in due time. He also encouraged a diplomatic core for his state, which would facilitate, maybe, if he could get lucky, a peaceful separation from Seleucos. The likelihood of that is of course quite low, but it would be a great alternative to war. Trade-wise, Bactra, the capital of Bactria, is a bustling city, and so grain imports were prioritized alongside elephants from India to serve as work animals for the upcoming building projects in the cities. This was the great advantage of living out east compared to the west of the Hellenic world, as elephants from India were numerous, hardy, and valuable. The first major project those elephants would work on was the establishment of a grand temple in Bactra whose purpose was to firmly mark the city as one of the Greek gods, bringing prestige and conversion to the region. Rather than immediately look to break off relations with Seleuco, Sophites actually married his daughter, Laodike, with the hopes of warding off attention. It could only be interpreted as an act of friendship to intermarry the families, which might let Sophites plan his uprising without suspicious eyes over him. With Laodike arriving in Bactria, the elephants getting to work, and Seleucos facing opposition from the other Diadochi, Sophites drafted a letter, which he wrote in firm but diplomatic terms. He would ask Seleucos to release him from his servitude, not necessarily as an enemy, but as equal allies. While it was diplomatically worded, the letter did also promise war if independence was not granted, which maybe was a little too heavy-handed, as the letter was rejected. That being said, the matter of independence fell to the wayside with the Sogdian invasion from the north. It's unlikely these undisciplined nomads can defeat Bactria, but Seleucos did promise to protect his satrap regardless. Sophites thought he could perhaps hold his armies back and let his Greek overlord protect him, but Seleucos was being slow with his armies and probably was hoping for a protracted war to distract Sophites from his rebellious ambitions. So the Bactrian army was raised, in all its might, to fight against the Sogdians. Battles out in the open were easy, with Bactrian cavalry making short work of the weaker, smaller steppe forces of Sogdiana. Quickly, the Bactrian forces pursued and raided settlements along the way, reaching Bars Khan with the intent to burn the city down in retribution. The inhospitable mountains were a powerful defensive wall against potential sieges, with the foolish Sogdians believing they could hold out forever. But then Sophites made the call to his army that they'd be assaulting the walls. He reasoned that more of them would die of starvation, dysentery, and boredom waiting outside this castle for so long. Instead, some of them would die bravely, fighting for Bactria, and the others would be spared the ennui of a potentially years-long siege. In truth, Sophites was sweating bullets, imagining his home completely undefended while Seleucos was preparing for war. If he were to take too long, his entire satrapy could be dissolved right underneath him, and so these Sogdians would have to be defeated hastily. Boris Khan was burned to the ground, with the city reduced to rubble and the loot taken back home. Happy men barely mourned their fallen brothers as they were too happy to loot the silk, jade, and gold the Sogdians had presumably stolen from the Fergana Valley and Tarim Basin. With the war over, it was time to consider the fight for independence, but frankly, Seleucos was at the peak of his power at this time. It would be unwise to pick a fight now, so Sophites waited. He instead began massive waves of conversion throughout the realm, looking to stomp out the Vox sites to bring stability to the region. He would not abandon the gods to please his subjects, instead bringing the gods to them. It was a funny moment when after hearing of these conversions, Seleucos arrogantly sent a gift of gold to Sophites. He wrote with it a thank you note for undertaking the conversions of his future subjects. It seems Sophites' letter from before had been quite a laugh in Seleucia, as Diadokos Emperor felt Bactria would be his no matter what. 
While embarrassing, this would actually be an advantage for Sophites, since he knew Seleucos would underestimate him. Sophites continued the establishment of markets and tax offices throughout some of his outer regions of Bactria, and prepared for war. He heard news of Gallic invasions off in Greece, and he heard of the Antigonid victory over Macedon, and with that, he had a feeling that either Ptolemy or Antigonos would come to blows with Seleucos soon, so he declared a war for Bactria's independence, making good on his promise of war. The Sogdians, who as a result of their failed invasions were made subject to Seleucos, were quickly invaded once again, with the ravages of the previous invasions still fresh in their mind. Barskan, which was rebuilt to be an even stronger fortress than before, faced yet another Bactrian siege with much less confidence this time. Sophites gave the familiar command to his army as his men prepared to storm the fortress. It was an interesting choice, as these dead soldiers would be unable to fight against Seleucos, but it was also important not to be stranded in Sogdiana away from the real front. Sophites had very little time before armies from Mesopotamia would be descending upon him. Barskan, for its insolence, was this time burned not to rubble, but to ashes, as no man or woman was left alive in the city, leaving the region barren of human life. Cruel it definitely was, but effective even more so. The loot was overflowing, and the soldiers wore accomplished grins, hiding the scars of a deadly assault. The Sogdian capitals moved south to Shelgi, and Sophites followed them there, forcing a total capitulation before turning south to head into Ariana. A small Sogdian force, which had been in Seleucia to report to their new lord, arrived home with news of their home being eradicated, and so they attacked Kocha before beginning a siege in Bactra. They were unaware that the Bactrian army was already nearly home, and so, as they set up camp for a long siege, some 16,000 Bactrian soldiers arrived behind them, destroying them. The Sogdians were in reality a scouting force, who had already sent reports back to Seleucos that Sophites was still in Sogdiana, and so as the army followed the retreating Sogdians to Ariana, the Seleucid forces, divided and spreading out, were met out in the field. But he began in Margiana with a 30,000 strong force of Bactrians having a surprisingly hard time against the hard Macedonian soldiers. From there the army split in half, one chasing a Seleucid tribune north, and the other holding the border in Margiana. Persian reinforcements arrived soon after, but along the Margiana border Seleucos was looking nervous. War was coming from the west, and he knew it, even Sophites knew it, and although Bactria was an impressive jewel to have for the empire, Seleucos knew he'd have to give up on one of the fronts, and with his capital out in Ctesiphon, he knew the west was far more important. A peace was signed, with only one term. Bactria must be free. Shortly after the peace, Laodike took her own life, presuming that she'd be a Bactrian bargaining chip, but in reality, Sophites actually intended to have her as his wife for the long term. After all, he didn't want enmity with Seleucos, only equality. Regardless, he was single again. He considered options for marriage, and although the illustrious Morians would be a great option in theory, the reality was that the crumbling Indian Empire was too busy dealing with its own matters to be interested in Bactria. Sophites would settle for a noble within his own realm, Theodora Nicetas, who was an acceptable match. He only managed to have a few daughters with Laodike, so with no son, he was hoping Theodora could provide. From here, Sophites knew he'd have some time to build up his realm in peace, but the Iodoki would be fighting each other for a long time. The Sogdians were put in their place, and the Indians were struggling to hold their society together, so he focused on great construction projects, again using the elephants he purchased from India. Along the Oxus River, he founded cities, hoping to provide his people the opportunity to create beautiful crafts which would generate trade revenues and taxes for his realm to grow. Ultimately, he could sit and grow his realm all day, but he'd have to enter the stage of imperial grandstanding if he would want to survive. It would only take one ambitious step nomad, or one successful Diadokos, looking east, to end all his efforts. The question was what direction to go. While the Diadochi out west were fighting at each other, they would be insurmountable if he were to go on the offensive, and the same was true for the Morians. This wasn't even to mention that his realm was not exactly tightly wound. Sophites sponsored many courts and academies across Bactria with the hopes of creating a general Hellenic rule of law. While the realm was distinctly Bactrian with Hellenic rulers, it would always be divided, but he was able to establish a strong sense of Greco-Bactrian identity that came to replace the divided culture of before. While working on that, he did also work on having an heir, and he succeeded, with Theodora giving birth to a son, Demosthenes, who would be the heir to the realm. Sophites, quite frankly, is starting to show an ambitious nature that goes beyond his lifetime, as he's in his late 60s and already starting to feel his age. Nonetheless, militarily, he set his eyes on the Fergana Valley and the passage to the Tarim Basin. The Tacharians controlled the jade and gold mines in the Tarim Basin, and if you could secure that land, you'd get access to immense untapped wealth out there. The Fergana Valley, while weak in materials, was a breadbasket that could feed his entire empire, or which he could sell for great profits to fund other projects. The Shule Tocharians controlled both of these regions, and so claims were drawn up, threats forwarded, and war declared, followed by cruel warfare. The Shule ultimately just weren't at all equipped for a war on this scale, and so were absolutely slaughtered. The Shule were annexed, except in their direct homelands in the northern Tarim Basin, where they were turned into Bactrian clients, with the hope that they'd export their valuable goods out into Bactria. 
For one last project, Sophocles fortified the borders in Sogdiana and the Fergana Valley, hoping to keep his people safe, after which he passed away from a sudden heart attack. Although he was old, he hadn't been taking care of himself due to his focus on state building, and so he died, leaving the kingdom to his infant son, Demosthenes, at the tender age of four years old. Demosthenes is, for lack of a better word, a completely normal child. He's neither impressive nor horrible. He's just kind of boring, and he's been given a kingdom which is going through a boring period. As he grew up, his mother would watch over him and try her best to raise him, but Demosthenes proved obstinate. He just didn't really care for statesmanship. While his mother was sending diplomats to Armenia looking to arrange a marriage for her son, the poor kid was playing with his toys and ignoring his tutors. It was fortunate that with how Sophocles set things up, most of the realms grew independent of direct decision making on the Basilius' behalf. Even with an incompetent child on the throne, the realm grew, with gold mines in the mountains popping up, and huge farming projects along the Oxus and in Fergana growing to fill the bellies of the hardworking men and elephants putting it all together. Once Demosthenes hit 12 years old, which yes, we're skipping to since absolutely nothing of interest happened in those 8 years, he would be tutored directly in the ways of statecraft with a focus on economics and trade. His mother was hoping the boy would continue his father's work in creating a prospering kingdom based around the many valuable resources of the region. He was also sent out on his first war with the Phrynians of the Himalayas being stubborn about letting Bactrian trade flow through the vital mountain passes they controlled. Demosthenes was more interested in war than business, but ultimately was still just looking for comfort more than challenge. Pamira was invaded, and Demosthenes allowed the armies to raid and burn as they wished, mostly because that was what his soldiers wanted, and he felt no reason to stop them. It was definitely a harsher punishment than the Pamiris deserved, since they hadn't exactly defied the Bactrians immensely, but woe to the conquered, a Roman might say in the situation. The city of Tushkurgan, a large city in the plateaus of the northern Himalayas, was laid to waste, and this was actually quite a mistake, as without the city, a passage through the mountains would be much harder. As part of the war, Kenjin was conquered, and Kusta was made a client state, as a buffer against other Himalayan powers like the Sumpa. In the west, word of an Alan confederation forming was putting fear in the hearts of some of the more cowardly people in Bactria, as though the Sogdians had been put down, the Alans were from further west, where the fearsome Scythians came from. Whether the Alans would prove a threat was yet to be seen, but Demosthenes' answer was actually quite a shrewd one. In the Fergana Valley and Sogdiana, there were many Sogdians who previously were enemies of Bactria, but rather than treat them as such, the Basilius granted them citizenship in return for their guarantee to fight any horseback nomads that might choose to make Bactria their enemy. Using horse archers to fight other horse archers was wise, and for this Demosthenes would be known as one of the few settled Greeks to extend a true olive branch of citizenship to a people of the steppes. Once he hit his 16th birthday, Demosthenes married the Armenian princess for ransom, which was wisely arranged by his mother to help secure an alliance across the Caspian Sea. Bactria and Armenia combined would certainly be able to defeat the Seleucids, and the kings of both realms agreed that one day they'd carve up Persia amongst themselves. Armenia was once subject to the Achaemenids, but with that time over, they were more than willing to fill the power vacuum they left, once they ousted the Seleucids anyway. Years of continued economic development brought great revenues to Bactria, and although it was a prosperous time, news, both dire and fortunate, reached Bactria, with the Seleucid Empire finally collapsing to civil war, but also collapsing to the marauding Parthians from the north. While it was happy news that the Seleucids were falling, it was suddenly the case that a power vacuum was opening and quickly being filled by a new power that dwarfs the Seleucids. At the very least, this was an opportunity to complete the conquest of the Sogdians, who were still clients of the Seleucids. It was an easy war, as the Seleucids didn't even send any cohorts to help, and the Sogdians barely put up a fight, knowing their fate was one of defeat. Afterwards, Demosthenes continued his conquest north into the steppes, hoping to subdue any potential threats from the north, while he planned for how to deal with Parthia. He was older than he once was, and although not much wiser for it, he at least took these political situations more seriously than in the past. He decided that if he was going to defeat the Parthians, he would need a powerful army capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the speedy horse archers of the nomads. He decided the best way would be to outrange them with powerful recurve bows as engineers had procured from the steppes. While a horse archer is faster and can outmaneuver heavily armored foes, the standing soldier with a powerful bow and a strong arm can reach the horse archer before they get in range to land accurate shots. He would keep a large section of archers forming the bulk of the army, with lightly armored footmen to act as a pseudo vanguard leading to enemies in, flanked by horse archers of his own that could trap armies lured in by the sight of lightly armored footmen. This army was, in theory, the perfect counter to a mounted nomad army, but would rely on the hubris of the Parthian army, as if they were to show restraint, they could easily outmaneuver the round the army and simply avoid their arrows, but if they got overzealous, they'd be pelted with arrows and chased down by mounted archers. Demosthenes ordered his legates and tribunes to drill and practice in the ways of war against nomads, with the intention to invade Parthia in the future once his army was prepared to do so. He was finally stepping up as a Basilius, but this was a little too late, as the families of the realm presented him an ultimatum. 
You see, the families feared the Parthians, who were absolutely ruthless in their destruction of the Seleucids, and so they had planned in the background to remove Demosthenes, who they saw as incompetent, with the Bactrian Diodotus, who had been governing the Himalayas at that point. They chose him because he was an outsider to the great family politics, and they hoped to put him on the throne, have him defeat Parthia, and then promptly vacate the throne. Nothing could possibly go wrong. The ultimatum Demosthenes had received was one of death or abdication, and seeing that his military reforms were not appreciated, he chose abdication, and it was also clear that if he plunged the realm into civil war, the Parthians would surely win. Demosthenes was allowed to keep his personal holdings in Bactria, and Diodotus took the throne and reigns of the Bactrian kingdom. Diodotus was a humble governor of the Himalayas, looking only to keep the mountain passes safe and dealing with the local clients and powers of the region only insofar as ensuring the trade routes were open and safe. His subjugation, suppression, and domestication of the mountain guides in that region caught the attention of the great families of Bactria, who put him on the throne to fight Parthia. Always looking to serve his duty, Diodotus accepted the mantle of Basilius and was brought up to speed on Demosthenes' plans for the Parthians. It was a sound plan, and so the drilling continued. Out of respect and an attempt to keep the families away from each other's throats, he married into the Sophitid family, marrying Demosthenes' daughter, Diantha. The bride price was high, but he was able to receive funding from the other royal families as a sort of stipend to ensure he would achieve his goals. Nonetheless, civil war was on the horizon, and it would not be easy to prevent it. Bribes, personal friendships, holdings, and administrative leniency were granted all around to ensure that the realm would stay together under Parthian pressure. Already, Parthian diplomats and agents were sending the occasional threat or trying to find disloyal families to exploit, and Diodotus was all too aware. Some advisors believed a civil war would mend the country in some ways, let everyone fight it out and from those ashes rise like a phoenix, but that move would play right into Parthian hands. Looking to bring confidence and security to the noble Macedonian families, Diodotus granted extra rights to the Macedonian people of the kingdom, which did work to assuage some worries, at least in the short term. Civil war was, for now, avoided, and so Diodotus did not wait to attack the Parthians. His legates were confident in their archers' abilities to handle the nomad horses, and so war was declared, with Diodotus hoping to take the lands up to the Aral Sea, and maybe even parts of Old Parthia if he could get away with it. He called on Armenia to help, but he didn't expect much. He just wanted a western distraction to keep Parthia occupied while he ravaged the east. He sent his legion north to Gurganj, and the levies from Sogdiana and Bactria to Old Parthia. The plan was to use the legion in Gurganj as the actual fighting force and to have it focus on the war goal, while the levies acted as gnats that, while likely to be obliterated in combat, would fracture Parthian forces. The system mostly worked, with some Parthian forces staying in Margiana to manage the levies and their raids, while a larger Parthian force sat across the Oxus from Gurganj waiting for reinforcements. Thanks to the engineers Diodotus had added to the army, Gurganj fell quickly and the Legate fell confident enough to cross the Oxus to take the fight to the Parthians, who were happy to hold a defensive river position. In charge of the legion was the legate Straton Sophitid, a brother of Demosthenes who had been training with the legion for some time. He was the most competent and therefore chosen for the battle, despite some other families wanting their prestige defeating the Parthians. Letting family squabbles dictate war was a sure path to defeat. In Vizier, the battle was an interesting one. Neither army fully charged at the other, as both armies used deceptive tactics trying to lure one another into traps and false retreats. Ultimately, the Bactrians came out on top, but it wasn't a decisive battle, more just a skirmish. Armies looking to reinforce were caught out in northern Margiana, cutting off reinforcements to Gurganj, which had the legate Stratton to continue his occupations throughout the Oxus River Valley and De Hay. A Parthian army had made its way to Bactra though, and although the walls around would hold for some time, the levies were immediately sent to defend the city. So far, the Bactrians haven't suffered a single defeat, and spirits are high. Nonetheless, it was wise to not push too hard against the powerful Parthians, and so peace was signed relatively early. All the lands up to the Aral Sea, Old Parthia itself and northern Dahe were taken, which was surprisingly accepted by the Parthians. It seems like they were eager for the war to end due to their nomadic peoples having difficulty administering the complex local powers and institutions of the former Achaemenid and Seleucid empires. It also appeared that the Armenians had a stronger effect than expected. Most of the richest part of the empire were in the west, and the Armenians had occupied several important cities in Media. Theodotus had inflicted a beautiful defeat upon the Parthians, and in so doing, had potentially signed his own death warrant. The families, perhaps short-sightedly, wanted him off the throne now. He had done his job in their eyes, but rather than relinquish the throne, Diodotus made it clear that Parthia was still a threat, and he has to deal with it. He would first work on establishing cities in Choresmia, along the Oxus, near its estuary with the Aral Sea, in the hopes of creating fortresses and trade routes to both hinder and placate the nomads of the region. Simultaneously, he added to his legion with more archers, some spearmen, and cavalry cohorts. He also integrated the Shule Kingdom out in the Tarim Basin, so he could personally control the jade, silk, and gold trade of the region. His legions would need pay, and although Bactria was rich, it could always be richer. 
While he did that, he asked travelers about the far off west out of curiosity, and seen that reports of war between Carthage, a dominant naval trade empire of the Mediterranean, and Rome, a rising Italic Republic, were coming to blows, with Carthage mostly coming out on top. The Romans had been pushed mostly inland, and the Carthaginians were invading Sicily and Campania with ease. It's the rare case where Rome is getting their teeth kicked in, and it's always fun to see, since Rome tends to be a huge boogeyman in this game. The Legion used stories from the west of Roman and Greek tactics to play war games and generally have a good time. Play and practice are often one and the same, and in this, the Legion was honored as Adutrix, making them keep their lessons longer, and Diodotus continued developing the techniques his Legions were practicing into codified manuals that could be passed out to soldiers. His Bactrian Way is focused on a mix of archers and cavalry that could simultaneously repel enemy cavalry while chasing them down before they could escape. It was the exact counter to the Parthian tactics he was facing. As the army was expanding, so too were the food needs of said army, and so Oxiana and Bactra would become secondary and tertiary breadbaskets to the primary Fergana breadbasket, but ultimately most of the food would actually end up being traded overseas for income to pay the soldiers, as although food was important, there was already plenty in such a fertile region. With the continued development of the region, a new Macedonian man from Pella arrived and schemed his way into the pockets of the families who were afraid that Diodotus was becoming too much of a Basilius with all his economic development and military accomplishments. Diodotus, ultimately, could see that the families were against him, and whether it was because he was a Bactrian or a bit of a rogue king was something no one would answer for sure. He did choose to step down, in favor of the popular Eucratides, who also appeared to be a more competent Basilius anyway. It's unfortunate that Diodotus would step down so unceremoniously after all the service he put in to keep Bactria safe, but he earned himself a place in the history of the region and much wealth from his service. In many ways, he had lots to be grateful for, although he knew that his strategy was a winning one against the Parthians, so he could have gotten so much more. Instead, Eucratides would be the one to earn that fame, and he fully intends to bask in it. Eucratides is an extremely ambitious and talented ruler, immediately taking the reins of Bactria and facing disloyalty from the Bactrian families. He didn't have time to deal with them though, as all his focus would be on Parthia, so he gave out whatever bribes and whatever privileges he would need to ensure that his realm would remain stable. Part of that was uprooting some of the old power and gaining new administrators to take care of the realm, which he achieved by moving the capital north to Alexandria Oku, which he promptly renamed to Ukratideia, after himself. Names are an important part of legitimacy and legacy, and although he's a new ruler, it was an audacious move to rename one of Alexander's cities. It was an audacious move which was applauded, so long as he could back it up with results against Parthia. It was time to shift focus away from Bactria in general, as the Bactrian heartlands had been elevated by previous rulers to never before seen heights, and now it was Eucratides' time to use the power to put Bactria onto the world stage as a new empire in the east. He prepared his armies and called on Armenia to help, who was happy to join in pushing the Parthians out. This time he'd be marching into the relatively poorly fortified regions of eastern Persia, aiming for once great cities like Nishapur and Tusa. More importantly, his main goal for this war was Hyrcania, which was home to Mithra worshipping cults as well as great commercial cities, most of which have fallen into disrepair due to all the war and strife in the region. The Legion, Eucratides' proper fighting force, stayed in Aria to siege with its engineers, while the levies went west to occupy exposed cities and evaluate enemy forces. They were expected to lose any battles they walked into, and to just make it back home to report their findings, as well as harrying the locals such that they might lose faith in their Parthian overlords. The Parthians mobilized their forces with haste, and sent large armies out to confront the levies. 36,000 Parthians rode into Vishpautzatis to confront the Sogdian levy and inflicted a decisive defeat on their undertrained and under-equipped forces. They retreated to Area to report to the legate, while the Parthians marched further south to confront the Bactrian levy in Sagarchia. The army did its job and reported what it saw, retreating with extensive but tolerable losses. From there, the fort in Aria fell, and the legion marched westwards to confront the Parthians, who gained much confidence from their victories. The legion met about half the Parthian army in Godana, and inflicted a slaughter on the confident Parthians, who charged what they thought were more poor levies. Though did they know, they had walked right into the perfect trap, with archers raining arrows down upon them, and mounted archers chasing them during the entire retreat. 7,000 of Parthians died in that battle, while other Parthian armies went past the battle lines to head north to the Oxus, to siege important cities there. The legion engaged another Parthian army of almost 10,000 men in Nishapur and was able to eradicate them to a man. This was a devastating loss for the Parthians who went from being totally confident to completely shattered. The Parthian army retreated to the west to try and fend off Armenia who had recently moved into Mesopotamia after fighting the Seleucids, and in doing so, left Hyrcania and most of the eastern Iranian mountain range along the border with Gedrosia completely unprotected. After occupying all of Dehe, Hyrcania, eastern Iran, and Arya, Eucratides sued for peace, getting everything he wanted. Bactria suddenly ruled over almost all of eastern Iran and left Parthia in shambles, forcing them to release Persis as a way to neuter their power. Persis would later agree to become a client state to Bactria as thanks for their freedom. During the course of the war, the Medes had broken free, and with the acquisition of Hyrcania, Bactria's trade revenue grew immensely. 
Eucratides got to work immediately renovating the important cities of his new land and building up fortifications in strategic locations to keep his land safe, as well as loyal. His next target was likely going to be India, but for now, he needed to slow his conquests, lest the civilized world see him as some unjustified tyrant. Thankfully, he had the everlasting friendship of the Armenians, and since he had no intentions of going further west, it was unlikely that friendship would ever be tested. With Hyrcania, he did now share a board with Armenia, a thin one, but more importantly, an uncontested one. Given the immense population of these new provinces he took from Parthia, he did grant citizenship to the Parthians, forming a fourth block of citizens in his empire. The Bactrians, Sogdians, Parthians, and Macedonians would form the preferred people of his empire, and with these four peoples working together, he would be surely unstoppable. His conquest attracted Macedonian immigrants to his new cities in Parthia, and soon the Hellenization of the region continued in a more efficient manner than under Seleucus. His Parthian ambitions were completed, and though he could go further west, there were more riches to the east, in the land of the Aryans. He began his campaign crossing the Hindu Kush mountains, attacking Gandhara and the Indian Greek kingdoms of Kashmir. He was able to cross the mountains easily with his lightly equipped infantry and archers, and thanks to the immense food stores in his home, he could pack his supply trains full of food to keep the army happy and moving through the dangerous mountain passes. As he campaigned further into India, he declared war on Selvita, another Indo-Greek kingdom centered on the Indus estuary in Sindh. He conquered all of Gandhara, and up to and including their land touching one of the Indus tributary rivers, and then conquered the western portions of Kashmir, and made their remaining rump state into a client state alongside their ally of Kapisa. He was hoping to take on the more rebellious Vedic subjects of India once he could stabilize the realm for now, so by making use of those clients, he could delegate rulership in the short term to create stability in the long term. Against Salvita, he took their northwestern territory for himself, and made them yet another client state, meaning that his clients controlled almost the entire Indus River, with only Panchanada having control of some of the tributaries. He would target them later though, as for now he'd have to build up and maintain his recent conquests. It was with his spectacular victories over the Parthians and his advancement into India that much of Bactria was beginning to revere Eucratides as a demigod. He must have the blood of Ares or Athena to be pulling off these immense battles, slaying thousands and only losing a handful. He would replace Heracles as the deity of war in Bactria, and the city of Eucratidea would become a holy shrine to his greatness. To think that the Bactrians would be ruled by a literal god was certainly not something anyone expected, but that it was now a reality was something the world would have to get comfortable with. From there, Eucratides kept an eye on the goings-on of the rest of the world and heard more of the stagnant conflict in the Mediterranean, as well as the large Anatolian kingdom of Pontus and its rise to power in that region. He also heard much news of gods, and this was something he found interesting. Any god with their salt had a shrine, and indeed he had his own shrine in Eucratidea, but there were gods of all kinds around the realm that had their own shrines too. Voxite gods, Buddhist gods, Vedic gods, among others. He sent his legions on missions to eradicate all the false shrines, and they did as he said, sacking temple after temple in the name of their new god, Eucratides. He was, maybe, going a little crazy with power, but this is where we end the story of Bactria, at least for now. In the future, Eucratides set his eyes on the fertile Indus River Valley, but he's taking his time, knowing that his empire could collapse under the weight of conquests that go beyond his administrative abilities. In the future, he may yet found a greater Greco-Indian empire than any before him, or he might hold tightly to his Bactrian heritage and cast off the limitations of his Macedonian heritage. Time will tell. All Eucratides knew is that he is the god of his empire, and that while he owes it to his predecessors for building up the empire's economy to support his conquests, he also knows he would be remembered as the one to elevate Bactria to its greatest heights. This was the story of Sophites, the satrap of Bactria, and his desire for freedom for his diadochi yoke. It would start as a humble story of freedom and amicability, but would soon evolve into one of empire building and godhood. Imperator Rome is a wonderful game when it's paired with the Invictus mod, which is what makes most of it fun to play. To be quite frank with you, I haven't actually played Imperator without Invictus before, because this mod has become so central to the game's functioning in today's era. The work of the mod team over there is worthy of immense praise, but imagine how awesome this game could be if it were supported by Paradox again. That opportunity could be on the table, thanks to Lathe's efforts from the SS. If we can get 100,000 concurrent players for Imperator, we may just see this game come back, and I would love to see that. So if you've got the game, launch it today and play it a bit. With enough support, we could see Imperator's return. If you want a part 2 for this video, then definitely go launch the game, go to Lathe Discord, which will be linked in the description, and post a screenshot of your Imperator campaign, saying Tarkus sent you. I'll be keeping an eye out over there. Thank you for your time.